Please help me welcome Sydney. construction company but then we became uh, bankrupt but even though we lost everything we owned my parents did realize that everything we had before wasn't what they wanted all along they wanted freedom and adventure that you couldn't get in a big house so we moved on to this tiny little boat that my granddad had built and until 2014 we bought our own boat the sea monkey this is what it looks like on the inside at the front here, this is called the V-Birth. It is my bedroom. My brother used to sleep there, but now he sleeps somewhere else. And then here where it says store, that is called the sail locker. And we store heaps of emergency sails and anchors and all sorts of random bits and pieces. And uh, up there, the box across from the store, that is our toilet and shower. It is really small, but it's all you need. So then here, this long bit here, this is called the seti. What it is, is it's actually a couch. And yeah, so that's as big as our couch gets. And across from there, that's our dining room. It's our um, table and another settee. So then at the back here, this is our fridge. And it isn't a normal fridge like you all know. It is a big lump of foam that you need to lift up. It's very heavy. And then you have to stick your hand down into the boat and pick up stuff and then put the lid back on. So that's how I gained some arm strength while being on the boat. Um, then across from that, we have our kitchen. Uh, that round thing, that's the sink. And then the box, that's our stove. And uh, only two people can fit in it at one time. So it's very hard when you're trying to do a big cooking job, but that's what my dad's for. He's the chef. Uh, and then when you come up these stairs here, this uh, white area is called the cockpit. And that is where we steer the boat and have heaps of storage rooms under these seats, and um, yeah, that's our balcony basically. And out the back of these stairs, this is the aft cabin. This is my parents' room, it's the biggest bed out of all of the boat, and they have their own bathroom as well. So, uh, this is our dinghy, or in other words, our car. It is a little tiny boat that we use to take from our boat to the shore or to other boats. So, when we live on a boat, we don't collect things. We don't collect possessions, we collect stories and experiences. So we have a lot, but here you'll be hearing just a couple of the ones that we have experienced. So this we call drive through sushi. We were sailing from Lankari Island, Malaysia, across the Malacca Strait to Sumatra Island in Indonesia, and that's about a three to four day non-stop sail. And we're out in the middle of nowhere, and we see this tiny little fishing boat coming towards us. And we're like, oh, that's weird. He's very far out from such a tiny boat. But he came up to us to say hello, and my dad couldn't help but ask if they had any fish on board. And they did. So as we were moving in these real lumpy waves, we traded fish and money across each other by sticks. And this photo was taken also just before we encountered the biggest storm we've ever been. So we also broke our speed record and a lot went wrong that night. But this photo was taken just here in the Singapore shipping lane. And it is the world's busiest shipping channel. So we have a lot of close calls there. But you see in this photo, you see that big white piece there? That is a little sailing dinghy that my brother and my dad and I built ourselves. So uh, we were in the shipping channel, we were dodging all of these boats, getting very, very close to them. But at one point we went over another boat's waves and our boat bounced up and down that much that that little white dinghy bounced out of the boat into the ocean. 
So we need to do a full circle to go around and pick it back up again. And that caused a lot of holes in the little boat. Didn't really use it that much after then. And this is just something that my brother and I do for fun. What we do is we get the main halyard, and that is a rope that lifts up the main sail of the boat. And we just pull it down and we attach it to a swing thing, and then we just swing up and down the side of the boat. It's very fun. So we also get to explore places that tourists don't get to see. And some places, we can be the only boat people there as well. This place is very special. Tiam Island, where our boat is at the moment in Malaysia. Um, this beach, that one in the corner, on that same beach we had a beach fire one night and we watched turtles, uh, hatchlings come out of the ground and swim off to the sea. So we also get to make friends all over the world. This particular amazing person, this is Sandy Robson. And who she was, was we met her in Lombok Island, Indonesia. So we were on the beach eating our food and we see her in her kayak just paddling around the headland into the bay. And we just thought that maybe she came from uh, just a resort from around the corner. But when she came onto the beach and we asked her where she came from, she said, oh, I paddled here from Germany. Yeah. So this woman was paddling the world's longest route by a sea kayak in the steps of Oscar Speck, all the way from Germany to Australia. Five years to do so. She even got malaria at one point, but she still paddled all the way from Indonesia across the ocean to Australia. Yeah. So maybe you're wondering how my brother and I get schooled. So we don't go to way school, we don't get homeschooled. What we do is it's called world schooling. So we get taught by the people we meet and the things we get to do and the things we get to be part of, and that means projects like our one at the moment, the Seamaker Project. But before the Seamaker Project, we also, we made our own projects and we got to be with other people's, but we still do that. So here we traveled to Myanmar and we went down to the isolated south of it and we went there to the Thor Heidel Climate Park to plant mangroves. And the Thor Heidel Park is, it is an organization that is committed to the regrowth devastated mangrove habitat. So mangroves are very important for the survival of our planet and for climate change. So not only do they provide sanctuary and food to juvenile fish and sea creatures, or monkeys in the trees, or elephants walking through the channels, they also soak up up to five times more sea carbon dioxide than the average rainforest tree. So these mangroves are um, habitat have been destroyed to make way for things such as shrimp farming and uh, so that they can um, burn the wood for fire. So before we left, no, just as we left Australia in 2015, this was the first time we went off to Asia to sail around, um, we started the project Pencils for Kids. And what we did was my brother, before we left Australia, my brother and I raised over three thousand dollars to buy items like stationery, notebooks, and charts. So we could put them all into packs like these, and we hand delivered them to really remote and poor schools throughout Indonesia. And these kids were so grateful, but a lot of them had no idea what was going on because they'd never seen a white person before. But the, these schools, they only got like four classrooms. I'm like this school. This school's massive compared to what I've seen. So they were very grateful for what we gave them and it gave us a very enriching experience. But so where have we been so far? We actually haven't been that far yet because we kind of been stuck in Malaysia and the media project. It's all good. So we came from Brisbane, Australia, and we came for three months. We did sort of a very isolated on our own trip from Townsville, the city, a little bit north of Brisbane and we came up over the most northern point of Australia to Darwin. Darwin was where we began our trip through Asia. So that's where we started a rally, where a bunch of boats at the same time. And we went up and we reached through Indonesia. But you see Borneo, we actually didn't make it to Borneo. We got about three miles off the coast when the smoke from the rainforest burning that year was so bad that we couldn't see the front of our own boat because of all the smoke. And our boat is only 41 feet long. So 
uh, it was that bad, it was too dangerous for us to keep going, so we didn't go there, <coughs> continued on, and went up to Thailand, as far north as we've been by boat so far, and went over to Sumatra, we've been to Tiamat Island, Anambas Islands, and a lot of land travel since then. But our boat has been mostly in Malaysia for about four years now. So this is where we plan on going over the next three to four years. We plan to go up to Anambas Islands again, that is my most favorite place in the world. It is so isolated. We've got beautiful corals and rainforests and beaches. It's amazing. So why did we why did we create the sea monkey project? Well, we everywhere we sailed, we found plastic. We found plastic in the Great Barrier Reef, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, Thailand. It was everywhere. But this particular this particular place. This is Port Klang. It is at the very end of the Klang River, one of the most polluted rivers in the world, in Malaysia. And we were in this marina, we were parked up on this dock, and as the tide came in and brought plastic from the sea, and dragged plastic that had been dumped directly into the river more upstream, then when the tide came back out, it washed all the plastic out back out to sea. But a lot of it got caught on this jetty. So it didn't just stop here, it kept on piling up after we took this photo. And in this pile, we found everything from giant styrofoam containers to even dead dogs. But you may be broke, I mean, you will be grossed out, I know you will. Um, but from the story of another boat friend, they were in that river, and they found a dead human in that river. Yeah. Incredibly bad. Not even humans can see. So, we even find plastic in the most pristine places in the world. This is Tiamat Island, then where our boat is, and it is a beautiful island. It is so amazing, and it's so clean compared to the rest of the other places we've seen. But we still go swimming just out the front of the beach. That's the marina on the other side, that rock wall, and we swim amongst plastic still. It is everywhere. So even on this isolated island, it's remote, in Indonesia, this river is clogged up with plastic from other places. And this place in Sumatra, the story behind this one is very important to what we do today. So we brought our dinghy to shore so that we can go and eat. And we saw these fishermen were getting the ice blocks ready to take, put them into their fishing boat and take out fishing for the day. But these ice blocks came in plastic bags. And what they were doing was they were cutting the plastic bags off the ice, chucking ice in their boat, and they got the plastic bags and just threw them directly into the sea below them. And it was piling up, but then it got washed away. So when we saw this, we could not let this continue. So we stopped and we helped them cut the plastic bags off the ice. And we helped them throw the ice into their boat. It was couldn't feel my fingers afterwards, but we showed them what we were doing with the plastic bags. We collected the bags, we put them into that bag, and we showed them we were taking that bag over, and we put it into a dumpster. And we hoped that our message came across because they were not English. So when we came back the next day, we saw that they were doing the same thing. They were collecting the plastic bags and putting them into the dumpster. So, Anything can be fixed for a little education, at least. So let's talk about the science of plastics. So these patches here are called the five gyres. And some of you may know them, some of you may not, but anyway, what they are is they are essentially just giant whirlpools of plastic. So with the currents of the ocean and the wind that blows across the equator, it blows these currents and the plastic into these circular motions. And it just creates a dense, like concentrated uh, whirlpool of plastic. And you see this one up uh, next to America and us, Asia. This is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and it is the world's largest concentration of plastic. And it is twice the size of Texas, the U.S. state, but 97% of it is actually microplastics. So we'll talk about microplastics later, but sitting right on the edge of this gyre is the beautiful island of Hawaii. So when I visited Hawaii, um, you may, I mean, you will know, probably all know Hawaii, it's American school, but 
Hawaii is known for its beautiful, pristine beaches. And yes, it does have those. But when I visited there, I saw that their beautiful beaches were also littered with microplastics. It was everywhere. So that was me being a bit creative. But what microplastics are is as plastic gets into the ocean and the constant motion of the sea and the sun beating down on it, the, it causes the plastic to break up into tiny microscopic pieces, often too small for us to see. But these microplastics, they absorb, or they attract and they absorb toxic chemicals that we dump into the oceans. But they don't just also absorb toxic chemicals, they also absorb algae. So it gets all slimy and stuff. But this is what microplastics, break, this is plastic breaking down, this is what it looks like. I found this piece in Hawaii as well. See, it's all anyway. So it mixes in with the sand, and when you have sand mixed with microplastics, this is called beach confetti. Very colorful, it's very bad. So, yeah, so our ocean is turning into a plastic soup, basically. So how do microplastics affect our sea life and ultimately us humans? Well, as the plastic goes into the ocean and breaks down, and since it absorbs the toxic chemicals and attracts algae, the fish see these tiny specks of red in the ocean and they look at it and they think it's their food. They smell the algae that's attached to it and they think it's their food. They swim up to it, they eat it, and then all the toxic chemicals that's within the plastic gets in their guts and harms their health. So then they eat, so they eat like the microplastics, the, little, the bigger fish eat the little fish and some more microplastics and then we eat the bigger fish. So we eat the toxic chemicals and the microplastics in their bodies. So recent studies show that us humans are eating up to five grams of microplastic every week. It's about a credit card's worth of plastic. Yeah, but microplastic isn't only shown to be in food. It is shown to be in our water sources. In Britain, most, there are some scientists did a survey on all of the water reservoirs and rainwater they collected, and their research showed that basically all, no, all of their water reserves had microplastics in them. It's in the rain, so it gets, gets up there in the clouds and then it rains back down. And so microplastics are also in our air and in the soil. So it's, so we thought to ourselves, how can we help this problem? Well, the first thing we started doing was we started creating precious plastic recycling machines. They were invented by this man, Dave Hakens, who was from Holland. And we started building our first machine back in 2016. This is me here doing most of the electrical wiring on our first machine. It was very trial and error back then, but learned some valuable skills from that. <laughs> So what we do with these machines is we upcycle discarded plastic and turn them into an item of high value, like this necklace I have on my neck. Turtle necklaces. This is our main product that we make that supports our project. So we also have these turtles for sale if you're interested, but we'll see. So we also take these machines and we distribute them to poorer village communities where we create cottage industries there. We train the locals on how to use the machines so that they can upcycle their plastic waste into an item that they will send back to us and we will sell them. Then we will send money back to them. So we support them financially. That's our goal, is to educate and clean up plastic whilst helping poor so we don't only just make turtles, we also make these coasters and these pegs and some pots and in, that's just a few things that we make but in the future we hope to make plastic lumber to make small structures or park benches like this one. For each turtle necklace sold contributes directly to our project. It funds the distribution, the education, plastic education and uh, the training and beach cleanups and so that we do our recycling job properly. So we do beach cleanups. This one was in Hawaii and <coughs> this was me in Tiamat Island where I woke up in the morning and the first thing I see is this pile of garbage just 
floated into the marina and piled up in the corner of the marina after a storm. And I couldn't, I didn't want to look at that and I didn't want to have it stay there, so I just got our sand up paddle board and I went and picked it all up. So, we act, so recycling will never be the answer to this problem. But at the end of it all, at the, our main goal to come out of the machines is not the upcycling, it's actually education. So we do a lot of education in the form of interactive workshops with our machine and comic book uh, workbooks and also um, cleanups and speeches like this one. So this comic book here was developed in cartoon by my amazing mum. And the teachers, we taught it in our workshops to kids as young as six years old. It's very hard to do that, but it's all worth it in the end. And what it does is it teaches the good and the bad of plastics and how you can help this problem get better uh, through fun little activities and colouring in sheets. But we also have this workbook. This beautiful thing is the Ambassadors for the Planet workbook. It is a 255-page long uh, workbook that was uh, it was written and developed by a woman called Lindsay Hawken. She's from an organisation called Protect Blue in Jersey, UK. So, and then it was all illustrated by my mum. And this this workbook teaches everything from climate change and protecting our oceans to sustainable living, happy and healthy living, and rethinking design. And it teaches that through, um, you know, lots of interactive activities and uh, coloring in sheets and stuff, the same as the other one. But by the mid this year and late this year, hopefully, this book will be um, franchised out to schools all around the world. So hopefully a lot of Africa and um, uh, Europe as well, because that's good. Like Asia. Asia, a lot of Asia. So, a good example of the type of education that we do when we distribute our machines was taken, this was all in uh, Kampung Tekia in uh, Seremban, Malaysia. It's kind of like the main, it's just going to be the main capital. Uh, main capital. Okay. So these kids, we got them and we taught them how to do beach cleanups and how to do them safely. And also how to collect the plastics and bring them to the community center where our recycling machine is so they can recycle their plastic in something else. We trained the locals on how to use it, and that day we shredded a heap of plastic, so much, and we put it into a concrete mix, and we refurbished their driveway with plastic concrete. And we also made them an eco-brick fence. They made the eco-bricks before we even got there, and we used our plastic concrete to make them a little fence. It was really cute. So here are some upcoming events and collaborations. So I heard that you guys have just started your sustainability program and you're going to be beginning to do a lot of great stuff in the school. So here's an example of the great stuff we'll be doing this year, hopefully give you the inspiration. Uh, one of our biggest partnerships so far is with The Body Shop. And we are taking their collected plastic waste from their products and we are upcycling them into these recycled plastic keychains that are also scented, so it's like a fragrance. But this, the loop on the keychain is actually made of a rescue ocean um, fishing net that we have collected. This was my family uh, a couple of months ago when we went out into the mangroves and painstakingly went through them all and collected fishing net to be cleaned and uh, sorted. Mangroves are not fun to climb on. They look fun, they are fun, but they're very painful. So, we went out into these mangroves and we collected the fishing net because mangroves are like combs. When the tide comes in, it brings in trash and nets. It all gets stuck on there. It stays there forever and never comes back out. Unless you're very good at cutting knots like that huge one. So, our main goal, I mean, our, one of our future project sites that we will be implementing right now, basically, and very soon to be bigger, is a fishing net buyback scheme from the fishermen. So we want to stop these nets from getting in the ocean in the first place. And what we're doing is we are going to... Okay. So how the nets get into the ocean in the first place is when fishermen are out and they find that they have a damaged net or there's a hole in it, 
They don't take the time to keep it and then bring it back to shore to be disposed of properly. No, they just dump it into the water and it floats around the sea and it claims the lives of every sea creature that gets tangled in it. We'll be paying the fishermen to bring their fishing nets back to shore to give to us so that we can clean and segregate it to upcycle them into a number of products that we have. So just three days ago now, my mum and my brother were on Tiamen Island on our boat and they went out for a suck, stand up paddle. So they were out and they found this huge tangle of fishing net and when my brother got closer he saw that there was this turtle wrapped up in it. So they saw that it was in distress so they managed to bring the turtle back to the shore and they cut it free. And luckily that sea turtle was not in there for too long to have the rope cut into its skin which happens most of the time and that's how the sea turtles die. But it was fine and after being inspected by uh, Parks and Wildlife they managed to release it that same day. That was pretty amazing. Uh, one, this is one of the products that we turn our fishing net into. These backpacks uh, are one of our very recent uh, things that we make, and it is a 100% upcycled sales backpack. So we've collected down, well, discarded the sales from our boat friends, and we now turn them into these backpacks. And we are aiming, we are very close to getting the whole backpack 100% recycled and upcycled. What we do with the fishing net is put it on the front so it can hold water bottles and wet clothing. So what can you do to help reduce this plastic waste problem right now as individuals? Be aware and try to avoid these plastic criminals when you are out doing shopping or eating food or just in your daily lives. We have the straw, the plastic bag, the water bottle, the snack wrapper, single-use coffee cup, the takeaway container, his eyes are like what I look like in the morning, so I relate to him, and, oops, hold on, okay, and the soda bottle. As individuals, as consumers, we have the power to request for these alternatives. You can say, no to plastic straws, please. You can bring your own reusable alternative. See, this time in the set, I carry with me my handbag everywhere. It's very easy to look after. But then, on the inside, it's got a bamboo fork, knife, spoon, I've got three straws and a cleaner, and a pair of chopsticks on the inside. So, it's very easy for me to just say, no plastic straw, no cutlery, like that down there, and just bring these and then clean them afterwards. So, you also can say, no bag thanks. If you have a tote bag, these fold up very small, and it's very easy to carry around with you. Oops. <laughs> yeah. So we also make tote bags out of um, sails from windsurfing, and they're pretty cool, but we don't. Oh, no, we do have one. Look, this is one of the bags that we make. It's made out of a windsurfing sail that was my dad's, but he doesn't do that anymore, so we've now given the sail a new life. And. So think before you buy, because think to yourself, can you buy this item better? Can you buy it without plastic, or can you buy it in, without plastic at all, uh, in a reusable container, and then refill it later? Or can you buy it organic, maybe, for better for your health? But plastic is forever. When we are long gone, plastic will be there on Earth still, just sort of laughing at us, saying, hi, oh, we're still here, we're gone. No. So, yes, thank you very much.